Thank you, thank you, thank you for introduction. So yeah, I have this like kind of double title, uh, ML engineer and cloud solution architect. Um, I work between different teams like data science and DevOps teams, uh, working to build like a nice fruitful collaboration. Uh, in real life, it looks like this pretty much. So if you ever try to explain to data scientists why security is uh, important or to the DevOps engineers why data scientists need uh, production data in development environment, you know, uh, so I'm basically in the middle there, like uh, that lady trying to uh, uh, connect the dots together. So um, for this talk, I took several assumptions, uh, and I know like people like tooling and different uh, technology and stuff, and everyone has a preference, but just to make it simple, I took three assumptions. One is that Python is basically the language for AI, I know, like there's Julia Kohn, right? Like people will complain. But let's uh, think about this uh, in this way that uh, Python is basically the interface or the language for AI. Everyone uses Python for that. The second thing is PyTorch is the deep learning framework. Um, and the last one is that NVIDIA is basically the main uh, GPU monopoly. Of course, there are other tools available, but if you open your like cloud, uh, uh, list of computes that are available, most probably there will be NVIDIA mostly there. So basing uh, on this stack, uh, let's look what we can do basically in model training and uh, in the inference to optimize our models. Uh, before that, I think I have, uh, should be one more slide there. Hmm. Strange. Well, okay, maybe it's later. But anyway, so we have two stages, right? Model training and model inference. I generated those images with DALI 3, and as you can see, model training looks very, very nice, and model inference is just like a bunch of blocks uh, connected with something, and no one really figured out what it is. There's a very nice name for the, one of the packages there. It's like scikit-lean, I think, something to take maybe for, uh, for the next package if someone is looking for a name. But essentially, during model training, we just experiment, right? We have Jupyter, we have uh, VS Code, we just uh, experiment, we build the model. The output of it is that some file. And then we, in, in production, we have a lot of different technologies built on top of that, and we would like to use it. So here I have like Onyx, Onyx Runtime, very specific one also for NVIDIA, Triton. So we will go into those two stages. Oh, no, that was a slide. Nice. So uh, a bit of the anti-hype uh, slide, right? Like if you uh, have currently uh, Excel in production that maybe you don't need uh, ML or latest LLM uh, in production by the, next of, uh, by the end of next week, think about it before you start doing anything. And also, uh, I think the, one of the good highlights of this year that we finally have Python support in Excel. So people all interested in LLMs these days, but I guess it's like deserves it, right? So think about that, but now let's jump to the directly to the model uh, training and optimizing it. So the first trick, it's uh, uh, mixed precision training. Very, very simple thing, right? Like you have a float 32, so it eats up a lot of memory. You use half precision, and then you save half, and then you speed up, like, by a factor of three. Uh, well, that's uh, good. I think uh, you can just use it. There are some, um, of course, practicalities, right? You see the diagram over there. Let me see. This one particularly, so if you just blindly apply this and you start converting parameters of your neural network to like a lower precision, you will get a lot of numerical instabilities. If you use PyTorch or PyTorch-based framework, they kind of like uh, uh, automate it uh, for you. Like I remember when it became available like five years ago or something like that, it was like very difficult to use. Now it's pretty much like a turnkey in solution. You just enable it and you use it. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me see something else on the slide. Not uh, really. So that's basically the main point of the uh, mixed precision, and you can use it within the PyTorch ecosystem very well. Saves by a factor of three. For your workload, it can be different. Um, I noticed that sometimes it can be factor of five, depending on the network, depending on your training loop. Another thing is batch size and optimizer. So generally speaking, uh, you want to maximize the utilization of your compute, right? So you can uh, pick a batch size, and usually the bigger batch size, the better, while say usually, sometimes it's not the case. 
so you want to maximize the batch size. And then when you do that, uh, you also would like to tune your learning rate accordingly to your batch size. So they go hand in hand. And another thing that is mentioned here is that uh, choice of the optimizer is very important. So there are also right now optimizers that support lower precision. And they, uh, all these um, parameters that you store for optimizer, they can also uh, improve a lot if you use like quantized optimizers, for example, like also by a factor of four or even more. And uh, you don't have to do it also manually. So there are some techniques that you can use also support in, in most of the deep learning frameworks. You can find some routines that allow you to pick uh, preferable batch size and learning rate. So you will start not just guessing, but with something really uh, aligned. Another thing. Um, Gradient accumulation. So this is not really saving anything. It's more like overcoming limitation of your particular uh, compute. So let's say you have one GPU, but you really want to have that big batch size. Uh, like you cannot live with batch size of eight. You need like really 64 or something like that. So what do you do? You basically uh, chunk uh, your uh, batches. So you have like a bunch of mini batches, and then you accumulate the gradients over here. And you do update only when you reach your effective batch size. This is just, uh, it's helpful sometimes. And you can go like, I don't know, to very, very, very big uh, batch sizes there if you really would like to do it. And it helps uh, better convergence of your algorithms. Um, but again, it's not speeding up anything. It's just overcoming the limitation. Another technique called gradient checkpointing. This one is a lifesaver. So if you think about it, we don't have to store everything in the memory every single, uh, at, at every single moment in time, right? So we can only save some like strategic points, and particularly for gradient, like uh, you can uh, look, for example, uh, for activation maps, right? Uh, during the forward pass, you don't need to store everything. So you can just store uh, whatever you need. The gradient checkpointing deserves a separate talk, actually. I just want to briefly mention that. But this one saves the memory and speeds up your workload. Uh, you can use both also, like with the one, like with the turnkey solution in PyTorch or PyTorch Lightning. So, what else do we have? Uh, data preloading. So there are a lot of talks about data these days, uh, but I still see people using one single thread, and they have like a very powerful GPU that just sits and waits like this track there, and you have like one worker loading the data. So very simple thing to do here is that you can, uh, first of all, uh, bump up the number of uh, workers, like threads, that loading your data. And you can also pin the data to the memory. So that's also very simple to do in PyTorch. Um, and what this will allow you to do is that you can, in parallel, prepare your batches on the CPU while your GPU is doing the inference. And then you don't have this bottleneck. So that's very important to have these two pieces in mind, right? that you have powerful CPU that's busy, and the GPU as well is busy. So you can maximize utilization. Also very, very simple thing to enable. Uh, but uh, still a lot of people missing that part. Um, now, uh, compilers. I'm just going to browse through it very, very quick. But essentially, I think for most data scientists, we operate on this level, right? So maybe like this here. So we have our favorite framework. I'm not sure why I put others. I was focusing on PyTorch only, but anyway. Um, and then you have high-level uh, representation, which is your computational graph. And then it goes uh, forward until the machine code that is basically optimized to run on the particular GPU. But there's like steps in the middle, right? So like usually this topic is very uh, important on inference part, on optimization. But there's also interesting thing that you can do during training as well. So like. Uh, uh, compilers itself, right? So uh, you have different types of them. Uh, I particularly want to emphasize the, this uh, block here, the tuned uh, compiler, uh, tuned uh, layer. So it goes via different, uh, via different intermediate representation. So computational graph, tuned uh, intermediate representation, low level, like something where NVIDIA compiler or LLV LLVM is present, and. Uh, one reason why you shouldn't trust benchmarks, there's this machine learning performance uh, benchmark website where all the companies put like a lot of benchmarks. Uh, well, I'm pretty sure 
NVIDIA engineers can optimize ResNet 50 on their hardware, just like really manually programming and uh, tuning uh, its uh, performance. So, but for your workload, if you just take one-on-one -on -one some network, it will not always perform the same way. So uh, just be aware of that. But essentially, compilers are very important. And uh, the nice thing in PyTorch ecosystem right now is that I think uh, this year or like uh, last year, end of last year, they introduced basically Torch compile functionality, which um, wraps your model and optimizes it also during the training. And it's basically out of the box gives you like 51%, they claim. Again, for your workload can be different, but whatever. Like if you get it with one line of code, why not? Um, of course, compilation takes time, especially uh, at the beginning of the training, like the first uh, epoch will be way longer than your regular one, but then the further one will be way faster. Very, very nice uh, achievement, I think, from the PyTorch team. And here you see also the representation that what they do exactly when uh, this process is coming. So they're, like, they're acquiring the graph, very similar to the previous uh, picture that I showed. Then they do some uh, lowering of the graph, like uh, merging the layers and stuff like this. And then they support all kinds of different um, Backends, but on that a bit later. So 51%. So I think if we'll start adding all the techniques, you will already speed up very f uh, fast uh, your workload. Okay. Um, now the obvious part, right? I, I, maybe I should have started with this one. So you most probably seen the papers when uh, researchers from some big tech company use uh, 10,000 uh, GPUs for two months and they train the model and school model, we all can reproduce it, of course. Um, so that's what about this, so multi-GPU training. So as soon as you're squeezed everything from your single GPU for your model and you think like, okay, it takes long, I have way more data coming, you go to this multi-GPU setting. There are a lot of uh, techniques that you can use there. Data parallelism is the most uh, common one. Essentially what you do, you just copy your model, uh, to set of GPUs, and then you run uh, parts of your data basically on each GPU, and you synchronize some time. And the level of synchronization diverse between different techniques. So in PyTorch ecosystem, it's uh, distributed data parallel is very common one. Really suggest to take a look. Data parallel is less, but I mean, it's all differences are in the, in the communication overhead and how you update the parameters uh, of your networks. Um, uh, let me see. Yeah, there's also. Uh, briefly mentioned tensor pa parallel and uh, model parallel, and it all boils down to how you slice your model. So tensor pa parallel, just you run first half of the model, for example, just slice it like, like this. You run one half on one GPU and another half of another one, and tensor parallel when you cut it model like this. So you basically have your graph, and then you just split like matrix multiplication. It's very parallelizable. You can run it across several GPUs. But that's very specific, and um, yeah, in some cases you might use it, but mostly people use data parallelism. One more technique that I want to highlight here, which just like saves a lot of memory if you're really into the business of like taking maximum from your GPUs that you have, it's called uh, the row. Um, and uh, the way how you can think about this is like if you organize a party. In the data parallel, in the previous scenario, the party will look like this. So you have like set of friends, and every friend brings everything that's needed for a party. So everyone comes, uh, like one friend brings everything. Beer, pizza, uh, napkins, uh, everything. And then they sit together, all these friends, they eat mostly, and they just sometimes occasionally talk with each other. So it's a data parallel if you substitute friends as a GPUs. This method is actually like a normal party. Instead of uh, uh, one person like bringing everything, each friend brings something, and they uh, share it uh, with each other, and they just basically uh, enjoying the party, and they talk a lot. That's what's happening here, essentially. So this is basically a standard one, and this is the zero. So parameters of the network shared between set of the GPUs, and they talk with each other a lot during forward and backward pass, uh, and it's a very amazing technique. Microsoft basically uh, states that, okay, if you want to train a trillion parameter model, with this technique, you will just need, uh, what's that, thousands of GPUs and 60 gigabytes of uh, video memory for each GPU. I mean, I think it's uh, very, very reasonable, very nice. And uh, yeah, uh, feel free to give it a try. So uh, that's about um, 
optimizing model training. Now a bit of the code, so I cannot just uh, remove my DevOps hat and then I need to say that. So organize your code into the Python package. I guess it's obvious, but uh, maybe not for some people. They're just f uh, If you write something, think Python packages. They are shareable. You will make your DevOps people happy. And uh, yeah. Then another thing, use a Jupyter Notebook as a front end for your uh, application. What it means is that you start writing in Jupyter, and then you, th there's this always moment in time when your uh, notebook becomes a, a novel, novel, right? Like very, very long, and you need to scroll up and down and stuff like that. I know that there's different techniques to make Jupyter Notebook production ready, uh, freeze the state, use paper meal, what kind of, I mean, you can use it if you want, but please don't. And uh, just, if you write something, you sketch, use notebook as notebook, it's called for that uh, notebook for the reason. And another thing is the containers, so if you're a data scientist, look at containers. I think all other thing your uh, infrastructure team and DevOps team can figure out for you, but if you can package it in container, it's very, very nice. All the techniques that I mentioned before, I highly suggest you go hands-on and just try to implement them. And the nice part is that this, uh, there's this framework, PyTorch Lightning, which I think, uh, yeah, it has, it has support for different accelerators. It has different uh, devices, like you can put multiple GPUs there. You can play with precision. And all these techniques that I mentioned, gradient checkpointing, gradient accumulation, everything is available there. So you don't really need to implement things. But you can take some model and see how much speed up you can get on your uh, compute. Now we go to the boring part, which is uh, inference um, and uh, optimization for the inference. So quite standard way of thinking about that is that you have some model, right, like this PTH file in PyTorch. And then in order to run it on uh, some particular hardware, you need to optimize it on top of that, right? So in this case, there's a set of technologies uh, those, those two are uh, related to interpretability and optimization of the model, and then Onyx runtime, it's just like runtime to run it, very high performance one. And then in the end, it all goes to some server. So you have some serving solution for your uh, ML models. And uh, let's look into all of these things together and also discuss the problems uh, that can occur. So Onyx, it's a very uh, like open neural network exchange. Sounds like some kind of like uh, broker or something like that. But anyway, um, uh, this is very helpful if you have multiple teams working in different technologies. One team speaks PyTorch, another team speaks MATLAB uh, or I know uh, TensorFlow. Um, and uh, you are DevOps engineer and you think like, okay, I don't want to learn uh, particular uh, proprietary graphs of this uh, neural network uh, technologies. I just want to run it in some standard format. That's how Onyx came into the picture. It basically allows you to convert it to something that you can share uh, easily with the, within the company. And the nice part is that while initially Onyx was focused on um, neural network support only, it also supports uh, scikit-learn and all other, and other uh, techniques like a traditional machine learning, which is uh, also very great. We still do traditional machine learning, right? Um, so that's about Onyx. Onyx runtime, it's basically a uh, next evolution step, right? So you have that model, you want to run it, and you want to apply a lot of optimization to that. Um, Onyx, in this case, supports this execution provider, so basically each and every hardware manufacturer or their team of engineers, they implement those providers over here, and then you can just plug it in easily. So it's more like an open source ecosystem, so in case if you want to run machine learning model on uh, FPGA, for example, um, or on some other device, like uh, from any other manufacturer, you can implement the provider and use it, so it's, uh, it's very nice, and it's also uh, very, very fast runtime, so I would suggest it as a first choice, like especially if you are in that ecosystem, so if you're using Onyx already, Onyx runtime integrates very well with that. Uh, there will be another talk about quantization uh, later on today. Uh, I will just go on top of that, so uh, what, uh, uh, what exactly it is and uh, why it's also helpful. So we discussed mixed precision training, and um, uh, mixed precision training it helps during speed up things during the training, and quantization is the concept that uh, introduced for inference. So imagine you have a very low profile edge device and you really would like to make your model very, very small and very, very performant. So you use quantization and this is the picture basically how um, 
the view of the world is changing uh, if you change the amount of uh, bits per pixel and the accuracy as well. So quite often you will lose performance when you do quantization because it's usually very harsh. You can go like up to int 8 or even lower these days. And uh, you need to really see and monitor the quality of your model if it's still performing to your uh, evaluation metrics. One interesting technique here is this quantization-aware training, uh, which allows you to simulate what's going to happen with your model when you apply those harsh uh, uh, quantization, like how it will perform on the training uh, time. And uh, basically, uh, that's uh, about it. And a lot of these frameworks, like going forward, for example, TensorRT, again, this is NVIDIA-specific, right? You have NVIDIA GPU, and you want to optimize performance on that GPU. What you do, you run TensorRT. TensorRT is outputting uh, some engine uh, uh, out of it, and it supports quantization of our training, post-training quantization, and all these things that I mentioned before, out of the box. And uh, basically, the only downside is that if you optimize on one GPU, and then um, somewhere in time you decide just to switch GPUs, you will need to do it again, because you may have actually uh, worse performance. So that's uh, not nice, but then it also runs all this optimization as well as Onyx runtime. So you have here like layer tensor fusion, uh, weights calibration, kernel auto tuning. All these things are done for you and it speeds up significantly the inference time for your GPUs, for your models. Sorry. Um, let me see. Yeah, the last bit. This is mostly relevant, I think, for companies, um, but let's say you have uh, multiple models that you would like to host. Um, in a simple scenario, you may think like, okay, I can have, I have my model, I can just uh, put fast API on top of that and be happy with this. Yeah, I think for, uh, for experiments, it works well, but uh, if you go in a scale, you need something more, and usually, even not like focusing on Triton particularly, but you need these components, right? So you usually have different types of workloads. You have a batch workloads that's running maybe daily. You have real-time workloads like the API, someone is calling some API, and you have also streaming sometimes, and you would like to accumulate that all in your serving solution, right? You need different interfaces, uh, gRPC, uh, HTTP that works there. You want to support multiple backends in this case, like uh, uh, Triton supports like, um, all of these things that you use usually like a standard stack. And uh, uh, quite often you have a dedicated model registry where all your models are landing, so you can basically deploy them. There are multiple other things. One important aspect here is that you want to save costs. Unless you're running a GPU cluster on-prem, I think most of the companies, they use public cloud. So you want to make sure that for the money that you pay for GPU, you get maximum out of it, and they're not idling, and those, those solutions, they are helping very well for that. Plus, they also integrate with a lot of system. I think world runs on Kubernetes these days, mostly, so you can also import all the metrics, and you would like to know where things go wrong, and all those kind of things. Um, so, the point being here, it's not necessarily about Triton, but if you want to go uh, like, um, I don't know, like more or less professional about serving your models, you need a solution. But there are multiple of them and also in open source. I mean, Tensor, RT is, uh, Tensor Triton is open source, but there is also other uh, technologies open source that uh, you can use, um, and they're all serving what you need. But then um, back to, the, to this picture. Uh, I personally don't like that we have to go like, okay, we, Python is the best language, right? But it was already mentioned that Python is kind of like a duct tape language or like interface language, right? So we all go then to C++ and then we go uh, even further. So if I put head of data scientist, I don't care. I just want to write a Python code and I want it to be performant. Can I have it, please? The answer so far was not really, okay? I mean, just uh, stay with this, right? You have this duality of the language Python, uh, C++. Then afterwards, you have all these technologies, right? Okay, I need to now learn TensorRT, Onyx. I need to run the runtime. Here, it's already kind of a boundary between uh, serving and uh, ML engineering, I would say. Um, why we cannot have it in Python, right? Because Python is 
slow, right? So uh, global interpreter lock, you cannot do a lot of things there. So that's why we use uh, all other uh, languages underneath. And then you always have this problem that if you want to debug something, you need to go an to another language and back and forth. So this year, Mojo was introduced. Who heard about Mojo? OK. Who haven't heard about Mojo? Check their website. They're also doing a conference. And uh, I would not recommend it for production workloads. But as idea, it's very powerful. And implementation is very nice. It's like uh, the way how they optimize the models. They use uh, some AI also there on that level to optimize it on the target hardware. So you can trash the CUDA. You can trash a lot of things and then just write Python, and then here I need to put like a, a disclaimer that uh, the py Python that's in Mojo, it's not really a Python. It's a kind of combination with system pro uh, programming as well. So uh, I would be very curious like, to, to see how people react on that, because some people like it. Some people think, like, OK, this is like another language. But they promise that uh, Mojo essentially is, a, uh, is an interface. Uh, it's a superset of Python, so like kind of Python++. Plus plus. And uh, try to write some multi-layer perceptron in Mojo and see how fast it's uh, performing. I really love it. I'm using it for some like uh, experimentation. And also another thing, back to LLMs, because these days we measure everything as uh, tokens per second. I, I think uh, next year on the Apple conference they will see like new iPhone. It can do thousand uh, tokens uh, per second uh, on the latest LLM, and people will be like, "Ooh, yes." Um, so this is the benchmarks for Mojo uh, for Llama 7B uh, model. I think it's M1 uh, Max uh, MacBook. Uh, so basically, not saying anything bad about those guys, but if you see the comparison on the inference for C++ and Mojo and the time, that's very promising. And that's what I think uh, overall community should go, that we have that, we, we solve that problem, that we don't need to think about hardware. Because if you see the news these days, every single um, uh, hardware manufacturing, they keep developing new chips, right? Because everyone wants to win and have, have a full stack, like uh, own the hardware, own the software, so like you can pay more money. And this is very nice that you can just switch between different hard hardware, so it's uh, I really like the promise of this uh, particular uh, framework. So check it out. And I think that's it. There's some uh, links uh, there, that uh, references that you can also take a look. I highly encourage you to go hands-on approach. Uh, we discussed a lot of tricks. So I hope it will help you in your workloads. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. I think we have time for maybe one or two questions, uh, if someone in the audience uh, has one. Yep. Oh. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have a question about um, managing uh, models in production, about monitoring and maintenance. Uh, what kind of frameworks out, are uh, out there for yeah, keeping track of them and monitoring and keeping track of drift uh, performance and uh, something like that. Not only for deep learning, but also for more, say, classical machine learning uh, models. Uh, that's a very interesting question and tricky at the same time. So there's this diagram of the all possible tools that you can use. If we print it, I think it can cover this whole room. But uh, there are m multiple tools. So for example, if you are in particular cloud vendor, quite often the uh, tooling for monitoring that they provide can easily be adopted for these machine learning workloads. If you need something specific, depending which kind of model you're using, if it's a, what kind of task it is, time series prediction, image classification, then there are specialized tools uh, also for that. Um, I used, for example, evidently, uh, it's a very nice library to use uh, for monitoring and drift prediction. But it varies. It's really, we can have discussion later on if you want, but it really depends on the use case that you are working on, where you host your model, what is available already in the serving engine that you use, and what you would like to monitor. But like concept drift, model drift, you can monitor in standard tools. They Now, I think uh, ecosystem is improving and improving, and every day there are new and new tools are released. So you will find something there in the stack, definitely. But it really depends on what model you are uh, looking into. Yeah. Yes. I think there was one over, over here. here. Long throw? Long throw. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. Hey. 
Um, okay, so um, I wonder sometimes if there's also a reason just to train the deep learning thing on a CPU, partially because we're all GPU poor these days, but also because I wonder if it can also be cheaper if you're willing to be patient. Have you looked at any of that? Um, not training, uh, but inference, definitely. And also, um, if you look at the scope of the compute that we have, sometimes there are GPUs that developed for this purpose. For example, AWS, they have uh, one of the type of GPUs. I don't remember exactly the name right now. But uh, you can start inferring, if you want to save, on the CPUs. For training, it's still very, very uh, time consuming. It depends on the network also used, but, uh, but let's say if you want to optimize time, you need to see what kind of network you are training, right? How much time one epoch uh, takes. And you can go with this and see, okay, if you, if you have time, you can wait. But uh, if it's something serious these days, networks are very uh, big. Uh, but it's an interesting uh, trial, I think, like from like cost perspective optimization. I would say that if you have like, a, if you can run a CPU for like a couple of months and it's something not very important, you can just keep it running. And let's say maybe you did some initial optimization of the parameters on the GPU, but then you just need to train your model regularly and you really don't care how long it takes. Maybe you can wait a week. Why not? I mean, I'm all for it. Just uh, save some uh, money and the compute as well, because indeed we are GPU poor. <laughs> All right, I'd like to keep it on track. I thought there was one more question, but maybe we can do that uh, in the hallway track. Um, thank you very much for the yep. presentation. On behalf of the committee, uh, nice. a small thank you and a free coffee for the rest of the yes. day. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.